the authors that are presenting their bills <clears throat> and members of the committee that need to listen to both the authors, the supporters, the opposition. Uh, please, for people in the audience, please, if you need to talk, please take your conversations out, outside, and then come back so, so that we, we can hear all the public testimony. So with that, we're going to begin as a subcommittee. And our first bill will be AB 130. We go in file order. Uh, Assembly Member Cedillo or Senator Cedillo. You're always a senator's senator. Welcome back to the Senate. Senator, thank you very much. I am ready whenever you're ready. <laughs> this budget or please education? please begin <laughs> members uh, it is a real pleasure to be back here in the Senate uh, miss you very much and I'm happy to be here <laughs> Let me say um, yesterday how pleased I was to see that our U.S. Supreme Court reaffirmed decisions we made about 10 years ago with respect to uh, Assembly Bill 540, a proposal that we put forth uh, acknowledging the fact that there was a large and growing population of young men and women who were brought here through no choice of their own, young men and women who had embraced our culture, embraced our values, uh, learned our language, all within shorter than a generation and who then had matriculated to our highest um, levels of education. These young men and women were not out-of-state students and we 10 years ago decided that we should create legislation that permitted them to pay in-state tuition. And we did that. That was recently challenged. Uh, in the courts and was heard by the U.S. Supreme Court, or rather not heard, uh, rejected by the U.S. Supreme Court, and they acknowledged that we were right uh, in doing that, that our reasoning was legally sound and that we had a right as a state to do that. Now that is part of a very rich history that we have in the state. Beginning in uh, the late 1940s, 1948, we had the case of Mendes versus the Westminster School District. And in that case, it was found that separate schools for Mexican students were unconstitutional. The interest of that case is that that case laid out the basis for what would become Brown versus the Board of Education. And uh, interesting uh, at that time was uh, the visits from Thurgood Marshall, uh, a young attorney for the NAACP who was visiting uh, in California, talking to the plaintiffs. Uh, talking to the witnesses, beginning to get a sense of what legal theories he could develop so that he could help desegregate the schools in the southern part of our country. Of course, that case was followed by Brown versus Board of Education. And interesting also was the fact that our governor, Earl Warren, uh, who was the governor at the time of the Mendes case, had moved on to the U.S. Supreme Court and actually wrote that decision. We then go from Brown versus the Board of Education to a case more specifically focused on the question of whether or not it's prudent uh, for us to educate undocumented youth. And that's the Plyler case, Plyler v. Uh, Texas. In that case, it dealt specifically with this issue. Should undocumented children be educated? It's a, it's a case that comes out of the 80s. and. I think the judges were correct in finding that that was not only a fair thing to do, a moral thing to do, a nice thing to do, but it was very prudent for the people of Texas and ultimately very prudent for our nation because it's, it's inconsistent with our values uh, and our uh, Constitution to construct systems that create subclasses. And that was the phrase that was used, that the failure to educate these young people would construct a subclass of young people who would be destined to crime, poverty, and welfare. This would not be good for the people of Texas, nor good for our country. 
That was retested in our state again in the mid-90s with Proposition 187. Uh, and of course, the court relying on Plyler rejected uh, 187. We were all here and we all were f familiar and, and intimately aware and experienced the tension it created in our state. And we are thankful that we got relief from the courts on that matter. And then, of course, just as we heard Monday, the court has ruled that our AB 540 program uh, is legally sound and morally sufficient. Now, I say those things because too often I hear in this building, obviously you can hear on radio, that undocumented students have no rights. And we see that the rule of law is that nothing could be further from the truth that it is wholly consistent with our Constitution, the 14th Amendment, and case law that is built upon that. And so I think the first point we want to say that it is consistent with the rule of law and our values that students should be educated. Second, I want to say that for us, the people of California, that we have to be particularly focused. Every piece of legislation today should be focused and thoughtful about its impact on our economy. And with that, I say to you that we must acknowledge that by the year 2025, all economists will tell you that we are going to be losing people from the workforce who are skilled and capable of leading this economy. Engineers, architects, doctors, scientists, nurses, the whole range of, of uh, political leaders will be out of the workforce. We're going to lose a million people who have bachelor's degrees in science and the arts. And we have to replenish that workforce. Where will that uh, uh, replenishment come from? From these young men and women. And so it's incumbent upon us in this global economy, if we want our economy to remain robust, to be competitive, to have the innovation, to have the leadership, that then we educate these young men and women. Given those two premises, then the question of whether or not that this bill uh, uh, puts forth, whether or not we should permit these young men and women to apply and receive scholarships from private donors. Scholarships from private donors that will not cost one cent to this state. And I, I say to you that the question and the answer is simply uh, astounding yes, that this is a bipartisan proposal. Uh, recently in Illinois, they've constructed a similar uh, proposition. They call it the Dream Act of Illinois. Also, they are constructing a private fund uh, for these students. This bill. Uh, recognizes that uh, the UCs, the CSUs, the community colleges have their foundations, that they receive significant uh, support from alumni and people who support those institutions, and that these young men and women, given the legal foundation that is solid, given the economic need, and given California's rich history, uh, it's an, a, a commitment towards equality uh, and social justice, that then we should permit these young men and women to apply and to receive scholarships that are funded by private dollars. Thank you, Senator. Witnesses in support. Mr. Well, I think there may be many, many witnesses, so let's just have two or three witnesses provide the major support and the others come forward, unless you have something unique to do. Why don't you just wait? And, uh, uh, state your name, your organization, and where you stand on the bill. Yes. Witnesses in support. Okay. Uh, chair members, Nadia Lealcarrillo with the University of California in support of AB 130. Um, by making AB 540 students eligible for scholarships, AB 130 would help place these students on a more equal footing uh, with other needy students and would address issues of affordability and access for these students. We believe their accomplishments uh, should not be disregarded or their future jeopardized because of their legal status. And for this reason, we ask for your vote in favor of the bill and thank Assemblymember Cedillo for authoring this important piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Uh, Pedro Ramirez, uh, former Fresno State uh, Associated Students Body President. Um, that's the student government and uh, current uh, Multicultural Caucus uh, Deputy Speaker for the California State Student Association, which represents 433,000 students. Uh, we support this bill because it's fair uh, to give students a chance at their dream in higher education. Uh, it invests in California for the future of California, and it's 
equitable and the right thing to do. Thank you. Other witnesses in Good morning. Support? My name is Luis Perez. I'm a graduate from the University of California at UCLA and the law school there as well. I am their first undocumented law student to graduate from UCLA. And I'm here just to, to witness how hard it is to go through public education without financial aid and the, the work that's been done at the schools and how the, the administrators are willing to help, but they're not able to do that under some of the provisions of AB 540. If we're able to get rid of those provisions and allow institu um, institutional aid for these students, more students will be able to not only start school but complete it like I have done and be here in California. I've been here for 21 years and I'm waiting for the opportunity to become legalized and be able to use my degrees here in California and provide back to the, you know, to the state that has provided for me. Thank you. Well, thank you for your testimony and congratulations on your mm. academic achievements. We yeah. honor you. Other witnesses in support? Uh, Joseph Bijelab on behalf of the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles. We applaud the author for introducing this legislation and we respectfully ask for your support. Good morning, Erica Romero on behalf of the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities in strong support. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Andrew Keller on behalf of the Western Association for College Admission Counselors, Counseling in support. Thank you. Good morning, Antonia Camo on behalf of the University of California Student Association in support. Thank you. Julio Cesar Gonzalez, uh, representing California State LULAC, League of United Latin American Citizens. We strongly urge you to support this. Education, a key principle to provide for the community to lift the lower classes out of poverty and strife. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Freddie Campos, Sacramento State, I support this bill. Thank you. Adriana Sanchez, uh, recently graduated from Fresno State and a current graduate student. I support this bill. Rebecca Gonzalez, National Association of Social Workers, California Chapter, in strong support. Thank you. Andrew Antwi, on behalf of the California Faculty Association, very much support this bill. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members, Alex Esparza, on behalf of Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa, here in support. Thank you. Christopher Chavez, a recent graduate of Cal State Long Beach and president of the California State Student Association, and we emphatically support this bill. Go Beach. Go Beach. Good morning, Stephanie Puentes, uh, California Community College Chancellor's Office, and strong support. Hello, my name is Maria Luna. I'm a recent uh, Sac State graduate, and I am in full support of this bill. Andrew Martinez, California State University, in support. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Griselda Mitchell. I'm representing Stockton, California in San Joaquin County, a former undocumented student and um, now giving back to the community and provide services for migrant students. And we're a big support program in San Joaquin County is uh, dominated by um, Hispanics. And that's why we're here um, supporting City Yo in the AB uh, 130. Thank you. And you too. Congratulations on your accomplishments. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. Janice Warden on behalf of State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tom Torlickson in support, and we thank the author for his leadership on this measure. Good morning, members. Lisa Douglas representing AICCU, the nonprofit uh, private colleges throughout California. We're in strong support. Thank you. Julia Blair with the California Post-Secondary Education Commission in support. Thank you. Mark McDonald, McCallum Group on behalf of Los Angeles, Peralta, Rio Hondo, San Diego, and San Jose Evergreen Community College Districts and support, thanks. Mr. Chair and members, Khadija Alam Javed with the Advancement Project in strong support. Thank you. Joshua Golka with the California School Employees Association in support. Thank you. Tony Trigero on behalf of the California Teachers Association in support. Lori Najera on behalf of the California Student Aid Commission in strong support. Carlos Alcala from the Chicano Latino Caucus of the California Democratic Party in support of not only this law, but the rule of law. I wanted to remind you that there are many laws that have been corrected over the years, uh, such as the laws that kept Filipino women from immigrating to this country. There were laws that kept Mexicans off of juries before Hernandez versus Texas. There were laws that were cited that kept us in segregated schools. There were laws that kept us out of neighborhoods because of restrictive covenants. There were laws that interned the Japanese. All of these were rules of law in their day. And they were corrected. And this is your watch. It's your opportunity to correct a, a law that uh, should be corrected. These kids deserve a chance. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Para Hernandez, Unión Cívica, Primero de Mayo, Sacramento, California, on behalf of the more than 5,000 members of my uh, union, 
uh, we support this bill, and also I am a member, a member of the Progressive Caucus, of the Executive Board of the Progressive Caucus of the Democratic, Democratic Party, strongly support this bill. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning. My name is uh, uh, Francisco Gonzalez. I'm representing Lula. Uh, we, uh, we strongly, we strongly support this bill. It's been long needed. We have migrant children, lots of migrant children that we know that I know all their lives. They are been educating themselves. The teachers out there. They were migrants. They came illegally to the United States, and they are teaching today in our schools. And uh, I, I think we, we need we need to uh, uh, give every child an opportunity to ed educate, and they can help us educate our children also. Uh, there's another law that, that, that we need to look at. That, that is, is big, that our people are being abused. We, by, by our let, let's try. I, I appreciate that, but yeah. let's stay with Senator Cedillo's bill okay. at this moment. Okay, definitely. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Right. Other witnesses in support? My, good morning. My name is Darelli Baltasar, and I'm coming from Stockton and Concilio, and I strongly, strongly support 138. Thank, thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Valencia, um, representing NCLR, and we strongly support AB 130. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gabriela Santillan. I'm representing the NCLR. I'm strongly in their support. Hello, my name is Grisela Gonzalez, and I'm representing a Mid Concilio Preschool, and I'm strongly in support of this. Thank you. Any other witnesses in support? Are there any witnesses in opposition? Not hearing any members, not seeing any witnesses in opposition, members of the committee. Senator Alquist. Thank you. I remember many years ago uh, when I was in the assembly and sat on the Higher Education Committee. Uh, back in 1999, in 1999, uh, AB 540 died in committee, Marco Fireball's bill. Uh, the following year, I became chair of the Higher Education Committee and we were able to, um, to pass it because it only seemed fair, and I said this as a daughter of a Greek immigrant, my dad was a, who, my dad was a bartender, spoke six languages, uh, that if a student is in California high schools for several years, it sh would only be fair that that student be able to uh, go to our public uh, universities uh, paying the in-state rate. And, uh, we were able, I was a principal co-author on the bill back then, and we were able to see that it was signed into law. And I applaud the late Marco Fireball for, for what he did. So here we are now, and what this bill does, is says th these AB 540 students ought to be allowed to get scholarships from, from private donors. We're not using state funds. This is a most reasonable request. And it behooves all of us to see that all of our students uh, are educated. And so what I would ask of you, Senator Assemblyman Cedillo, is I would love to be a principal co-author on your legislation. I commend you for uh, being persistent in working on this issue. And uh, although there will be more discussion, I would like to move the bill when it's appropriate. Certainly, Senator. Senator Price. Yes, I just commend the uh, author for the, for the leadership and the um, uh, inspiring expressions of support uh, from those who testified today. <clears throat> I, too, would like to uh, join you as a, as a co-author on this, and um, I'm happy to support the bill. Thank you. Ditto. Thank you. <laughs> Senator Lou, ditto is that. Are there any other? Se Senator, uh, I, too, like Senator Alquist, um, I'm very proud. This is a historic moment today. Mm -hmm. uh, as there are many moments as we, this inexorable march towards justice and also towards rewarding our students who have met the California standards and allowing them the resources to go on to higher education is critically important for the, not only for the students that we're talking about, but for the vitality and of this state and, and the future generations. 
I also want to remember back and say well, how much debt we do owe to Assembly Member Marco Fireball, who came into the Assembly with me. We both were, I remember my first committee was on higher education. Uh, I think it was uh, Ms., uh, Assembly Member uh, uh, Ted, Ted um, uh, Lamp, uh, Le Le Lampert was the chair. Leppert was the chair. I voted for the bill. It died. And then the next year, I supported the bill in committee again and voted Ted, for Ted AB Lambert. 540, Ted, Ted Lambert, that's right, and it did not get out that year, and then the next year it did, and it's a long time coming, it's the right thing to do, I'm pleased to be here, and at the appropriate time, I too would like to be added if you, as a co-author, when it's appropriate. And with that, we do not have enough members for um, uh, a quorum yet, we, so we're operating as a sub, Committee, Senator Alquist, as soon as we do have enough members for a quorum, we'll be uh, making a motion on the bill. And so, if you'd like to close, Senator. No, simply that all of us have shared in this rich history, uh, this, as you eloquently stated, this march towards social justice. Uh, I thank you for your consideration. We are all very fortunate uh, to be part of this uh, moment. Uh, California, at this time, at this very moment, another opportunity for us to lead the way, to show the nation that we should embrace not just our immigrant past. Uh, so frequently, every American loves to talk about their immigrant past, but acknowledge that it is not only just a part of our reality today, but really, if we are committed to a, a future that is, is vital, a future in which we take, maintain our appropriate place in the global community, that immigrants are really the solution to many of our problems and are part of our future. California today will show that way. And again, I'm very proud to be a part of this. I ask for an I vote. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we'll, we're going to not be able to make the motion now until we have the quorum. So I thank you that we will, as soon as we have a quorum, we will make the motion on the bill. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Assembly Member Lara. Tough act to follow. <laughs> tough, tough act. Just say I'm dip. sure you're up to it. <laughs> uh, I could just you know, supplant my, my speech for Senator Cedillo's and we can move on. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And, you know, thank you for uh, recognizing Marco Firebaugh. Yes. It is an honor to. Uh, not only represent his district, but also serve as his chief of staff during my tenure here in Sacramento. A um, major legacy. This is part yeah, of his it is. legacy. I got and chills. One, and I did too, Liz. It, it is a wonderful legacy. Thinking uh, uh, what, you know, the powerful testimony we heard on AB 540 here in 2001. Um, uh, members, I, I bring to you AB 167, which will ensure that all students are treated equally when uh, seeking admission to a post-secondary standardized exam, uh, like the GRE, GMAT, uh, and LSAT. Um, AB uh, 167 will require test sponsors to provide a process for verifying a student's identity when they are unable to provide um, the required forms of identification, such as a government-issued driver's license or ID card. Uh, at the present time, not all test sponsors currently have a process in place to provide students with alternative forms of identification when they are unable to meet the requirements. AB 176 will re solve this problem by requiring test sponsors to provide a uh, process for verifying a student's uh, identification. It will also provide test sponsors with the flexibility to provide um, that process. AB 176 has received bipartisan support and I urge your I vote. Thank you, Assembly Member. Witnesses in support. Members of the Senate, Edu uh, Senate Education Committee. Uh, my name is Christopher Chavez. I'm the president of the California State Student Association, which represents over 400,000 students <coughs> in the California State University system before the state of California, the CSU administration, and the federal government and population at large. I really have appreciated the honor of being able to represent those students before you uh, this past year and look forward to seeing what this organization is able to do in the future. We stand in complete support of Assembly Bill 176. As the uh, Assembly member said, uh, this bill would allow students to have alternative forms of identification 
for um, when taking these standardized tests to enter into graduate school. <coughs> Uh, currently, the law does not prescribe a process for these test sponsors to follow, and as such, college graduates who do not hold a California-issued identification card face the possibility of not being able to pursue a graduate degree. There are a couple things that we must be clear on. In no way would AB 176 take away from the opportunity of qualified students. In, the truth is, without a formal process, we may be excluding a number of students who deserve the chance to go to graduate school. We will never be able to tell who the next doctor will be, who the next engineer will be, or who the next business leader will be. If we want to have the best pool of talent to select from, we mustn't let bureaucratic entanglement get in the way. It goes without saying that students who apply for graduate school at a California university must still display outstanding academic capabilities and comply with rigorous requirements. Indeed, in this time of persistent budget reductions for our public higher education systems, students are expected to perform above eligibility requirements to even be considered for candidacy for these graduate programs. AB 176 makes, makes no guarantees of admissions. It only allows for our best and brightest students to compete for an opportunity to expand their horizons and attain further academic, social, and intellectual skills. Secondly, there is precedence on this matter. Students who are graduating from high school and want to take the SATs are able to pursue alternative forms of identification if they follow a defined process. This process is set up to ensure that photo identification is provided as secure and eliminates the chance for, uh, for cheating to the greatest extent possible. In fact, I was a beneficiary of this law. Even though I was born in this, in this state to parents who were born in this state, I didn't have a government issued ID prior to getting my driver's license at 18. Long after I had taken the SATs, long after I had taken the SATs and uh, have, had been accepted to Cal State Long Beach. In other words, I, it had it not been for this process, it's very possible that I would not have been able to take the SAT, get into Long Beach, and be in front of you today talking about this bill and looking forward to participate in the Senate Fellows Program next year. It would have been wrong to have closed off that future for me for not having a piece of plastic. And I believe it's wrong to close that off that future to other people as well. I'd like to sit, thank the Senate Education Committee and Chair Lowenthal for giving us the opportunity to speak about AB 176 today. Excuse me, just one second. We have a quorum. It's a rare moment. We're going to stop right now. Will the Secretary please call the roll? Lowenthal? Here. Lowenthal here. Runner? Here. Runner here. Alquist? Here. Alquist here. Blakesley? Hancock? Here. Hancock here. Huff? Here. Huff here, Lou, Price, here. Price here, Smidian, Vargas. You have a quorum. We have a quorum. Could you kind of kind of draw it to a conclusion? Uh, CSS and I know that California faces many great challenges, and the state of education requires much thoughtful consideration and deliberation. No bill can solve every problem our community faces. However, we firmly believe that AB 176 offers California the opportunity to eliminate a hurdle for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Other witnesses in support. Good morning, Erica Romero on behalf of the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. Today is a great day to bring down barriers for higher education. We urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Joseph Vigella on behalf of the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles. We applaud the author for introducing this legislation and we urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Anthony Kamal on behalf of the University of California Student Association in support. Thank you. Pedro Ramirez, a uh, former, former Fresno State ASI president, and uh, I support this bill to allow our students to graduate and get into a grad school where they can contribute to our California's economy and the country. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Maria Luna. I recently graduated from Sac State University. I'm currently studying for the LSATs, and I am also undocumented, and I'm in full support of this bill. Thank you. Adriana Sanchez, a Fresno State graduate student. Based on experience, I fully support this bill. Thank you. And good morning, Griselda Mitchell again from El Concilio. Um, also in support of the bill. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Arely Balsar from El Concilio, and I really support this bill. Thank you. Maria Valencia, NTLR, we fully support this bill. Thank you. Gabriela Santillano, fully support this bill. Thank you. Priscilla Gonzalez, fully support this bill. Thank you. Assembly member, uh, are there, first before I come back to you, are there any witnesses in opposition? I don't believe so. There are uh, proposed authors or amendments. You, will you accept those Absolutely. as authors? Yes. Okay. So when this bill comes up, it is as amended. Right. 
I think this is another historic moment. It's to be at the same day as the DREAM Act. I think it allows, again, greater access. Uh, and it really just eliminates one of the hurdles. Right. Uh, and I think that there are already, uh, what you're doing is to put into statute, which uh, some of the test uh, sponsors are already doing. And this will, and plus, uh, enable that to happen and also post on the website what right. to do and to provide students with ample time to make sure that they can comply with these alternative methods right. for verifying. Right. We just so, wanted to create a, a uniform method, and uh, I think it's just easier for the test sponsor and the student. So. And, if, and that's really what it's all about, right, really, to remove those barriers and to make sure that the students who are really qualified have the opportunity to go on. Uh, is there a motion on the bill? The bill's been moved by Senator Hancock. Would you like to close? Just. Thank you again for this opportunity, and thank you for uh, allowing all California students to pursue their dream of pursuing a college education. Thank you. Thank you. There's been a motion on the floor by Senator Hancock, do pass as amended. Mm -hmm. Secretary, please call the roll. Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Brenner? Yeah. Brenner, no. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Blakesley? Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Huff? No. Huff, no. Lou? Price? Price I, Semidian, Vargas. It's four two. That bill has four votes. We'll place it on call for the absent members. Thank you. Members, before we go forward, I would like Senator Alquist uh, make uh, we we heard A B one thirty prior and Senator Alquist requested to be to make the motion so on that. So with that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I move uh, A B one thirty by Assemblyman. Deal. Thank you. Will the, secre will the secretary please call the roll on AB 130? The motion is due pass to appropriations. Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Runner? No. Runner, no. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Blakesley? Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Huff? No. Huff, no. Lou? Price? Aye. Price, aye. Semidian? Vargas? The, the bill has four votes. We'll place it on call for the absent members. Uh, while we're waiting right now, just before we begin, we have, I believe, four bills on, three bills on consent. Item number two, AB 169. Item number six, AB 230. Uh, and item number eight, AB 334. We also have one additional consent item with amendments, AB 180. So that's a total of four bills. Is there a motion on the consent calendar? Consent calendar has been moved by Senator Hancock. Will the secretary please call the roll? Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Runner? Aye. Runner, aye. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Blakesley? Aye. Blakesley, aye. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Huff? Aye. Huff, aye. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Price? Aye. Price, aye. Semidian? Vargas? You know, it's, um, you have eight votes. We have eight votes, which is sufficient for passage, but we're going to place the consent items, the four items, uh, on call for the absent members. All right. Um, Fong is standing right now. Assembly Member Fong, welcome. AB 288. <laughs> welcome to the committee. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Senators. AB 288 provides a helpful tool for community college districts to protect students and personnel from other students who have been expelled for serious acts of violence. Violence has become a common form of expression in our society. According to the California Student Services Organization, 55 out of the 117 community college campuses reported that there were 46 expulsions due to assaults, fighting, harassment, and other types of threatening behaviors from 2007 to 2009. Currently, if a community college student is expelled for violent acts, they can re-enroll without disclosing their expulsion at the next campus. To compound the problem, community colleges are not required to share that pertinent information with other community college districts. AB 288 will allow California community colleges to share student expulsion information when an act of violence occurs and places conditions on admitting a student who was expelled for serious acts of violence. This bill will also give community college districts the authority to conduct a hearing to determine if the expelled student still poses a threat to the student body and personnel on campus. 
AB 288 will ensure that there will be a process for re-enrollment after a student commits an act of violence on a community college campus. The intent of this bill is not to multiply penalties or bar access, rather it is to provide protection and safety to the student body and personnel of, on California community colleges. This is already standard in K-12, CSUs, and the UCs. This bill will give California community colleges the same flexibility. We have an obligation to provide a healthy and safe learning environment for students, staff, and so support personnel on community college campuses. AB 288 passed Assembly 4 60 to 0 with bipartisan support. I respectfully request an I vote in this important public safety measure. Thank you. Witnesses in support. Thank you. Mark McDonald, McCallum Group, on behalf of a number of local community college districts, um, the current community college district, Peralta, Rio Hondo, San Jose Evergreen, and San Diego Community College Districts. Um, I think the author did a great job in describing the need for the bill. It really sets up a process for community colleges to be able to utilize in order to ensure that there's safety on their campus. It gives community colleges the tools that are available to UC, CSU, and the K-12, other public entities. Um, Recently, we've seen a number of violent acts in the news that have occurred on campuses, outside of campuses, and community colleges really are the lone entity that don't have the tools necessary to ensure that, that they can uh, create safe campus environments, and this would set up that structure. We urge your support. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Good morning, Michael McGee with the Chancellor's Office Community Colleges. Uh, for the reasons previously stated, we support this bill and we do want to note, as stated in the analysis, the veto message from last year directed us to work with the, uh, the author's office to find an administrative solution, but we found that we needed the authority um, in statute to promulgate regs and we are in support of this bill. Mr. Chairman and Committee, Bonnie Slauson on behalf of the Community College League and the League is also in support of this measure and for the reasons stated previously by the author and the other sponsors. Thank you. Thank you. Are the witnesses in support? Andrea York on behalf of FAC, thank you to the author. This measure will provide um, insured security not only for faculty and classified employees but also for other students. Thank you. Are there other witnesses in support? Are there any witnesses in opposition? Members of the committee? The bill. bill's been moved by Senator Alquist. Senator Liu? Um, is it amended as, uh, um, as amended? As amended. As amended, yes. Okay. Amended. Accept the amendments. So you have accept, you accept, accept the, the amendments, amendments, yes. Yes. Is that, that answers your question, Senator Liu? Yes. Any other questions? Bill's been moved by Senator Alquist. Would you like to close? I respectfully request an I vote. Thank you. Secretary, please call the roll. It's due pass as, as amended. amended. To appropriations. Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Brenner? Aye. Brenner, aye. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Blakesley? Aye. Blakesley, aye. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Huff? Aye. Huff, aye. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Price? Aye. Price, aye. Semidian? Vargas? Eight. Bill has eight votes sufficient for passage, but we're going to hold the roll open for absent members. Thank Th you. Thank Senator. you very much, Senators. Are there any are there any authors? Pointing over here. Who's? Campos. Campos. Oh yes. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman Chairman and uh, members. Today I'm presenting AB 746 a simple bill to update our existing law of cyberbullying to include social network. Cyberbullying is the use of electronic devices to spread harmful messages or images about an individual or a group. The education code allows a school to suspend a student for bullying, including cyberbullying, when the acts are related to school. California anti-bullying legislation was drafted in 2006 when social networking had not yet become a part of everyday life. The increase in popularity of social networking has also brought an increase in abuse. Many young people have committed suicide because they were bullied on social networks. This tragedy now shows the need for this legislation. 
AB 746 will make the law clear that posting messages upon a social network site is covered under the Education Code anti-bullying provision. AB 746 is supported by law enforcement teachers and the PTAs in different schools. There is no opposition to this bill at this point. Members, I respectfully ask for your aye vote. Witnesses in support. Good morning, I'd like to thank the committee. Uh, my name is Barry Giardini and I work as a staff attorney for the Human Rights Fair Housing Commission. And anti-bullying campaign is something that we do take very seriously at the commission. Um, in fact, we have proposed resolutions to the city of Sacramento to work, a little louder, sorry. Um, we've uh, proposed resolutions uh, to the city of Sacramento to um, adopt the, this legislation as well as you know, make it clear to the schools that the social networking bullying is a big problem and it is an epidemic that's, that's only going to become larger. Um, at this point, you know, social networking has become, it's exploded in popularity. Uh, Facebook has over 500 million active users. Twitter claims 175 million users. Those numbers are expected to climb. Um, and at this point, they're talking about opening these things up to children under the age of 13 as well. So it is something that's going forward is, is a big problem. Um, over half of uh, adolescents report being bullied online or committing an act of cyberbullying. Um, this bill allows, those, allows schools to have the opportunity to, uh, it's, it's a narrow bill that only, you know, just clarifies the law and it's going to allow uh, schools to take action when, when it's deemed appropriate and when it's a substantial disruption of school activities. Um, uh, another main component of social networking bullying that, that's important to recognize is the fact that these posts have permanence. Um, when, when something is posted online, it exists there for, you know, in perpetuity until it's taken down or until there's some substantial change in the internet. So it's important to remember that it's not just the initial harm that's caused by the bullying, it's the secondary effects of having to relive it by having these things posted and out there um, for the students to suffer. So it's important that schools have uh, adequate means to take action against bullies who, who uh, post harmful things online. Um, finally, that just the nature of um, social networking in such a public forum, uh, it just exacerbates the harm caused to the victim of the social uh, network bullying. So uh, it, again, this is just an important bill that we think um, will clarify the law and allow educators and other school personnel to take appropriate action in appropriate circumstances, and we urge your eye vote. Thank you so much. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Tony Trigero on behalf of the California Teachers Association. We think the analysis uh, does a great job in describing what the issues are. We actually, as an organization, have not taken positions on all of the bullying bills that have been introduced this year because it, some of them lacked specificity. We think this is a helpful um, move in, for the districts to um, assist their students and their teachers in providing some kind of parameters under which their students would operate. So we're thankful to have this bill and we request an I vote. Other witnesses in support? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Andrew Keller here on behalf of the San Francisco Unified School District. We're in strong support of this bill. Good. Other witnesses in support? Witnesses in opposition? Members of the committee? Senator Blakesley. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to uh, ask a quick question on this bill. Uh, trying to ascertain um, and I know you, it references uh, other um, statutory language. What would constitute uh, bullying um, and how do we make sure that we protect basic First Amendment rights for people to have opinions that may not be, you know, particularly savory, but, you know, it's America and people are allowed to say kind of what they want on their website. Does it require that an unsavory comment be directed toward a pupil and an individual? Um, on a uh, social networking site for it to be covered uh, so, for expulsion purposes? Thank you for, for the question. So this doesn't change the education code, so it would be the same. What this does is it really just adds social networking to the code. Um, so it wouldn't change anything. Everything else would apply the same. When um, the, the code was uh, uh, drafted, you know, social networking, as it's been stated earlier by some of the supporters, uh, just has exploded within the last, you know, six years. And so this just adds the language to the education code, of including social networking. 
um, in, in reviewing how to uh, penalize or address or punish uh, a particular uh, or, or reprimand a particular pupil. And, and I totally understand um, what you just said. My question more speaks to the question of uh, under current s statutory definition mm -hmm. of bullying, um, would something like someone putting something on their Facebook account or MySpace account saying something derogatory about nerds or uh, people with a high body mass index generically, uh, could that be constituted as bullying? And the reason I ask is because this is not on the school grounds, this is not during school hours, this is uh, private conduct by citizens, although minors, um, and I'm just trying to make sure that this does not inadvertently capture speech that really isn't directed at pupils. Um, if it's not directed at pupils and does not have a specific um, subject uh, to it, then it would not uh, violate anyone's uh, First Amendment rights. Okay, and with that, I think I'd be supportive of this right. legislation, but that's an important consideration I that we protect people's First right. Amendment rights, especially when they're not on the school grounds and they're not directing their comments against fellow students. I don't know if this helps, Senator, but this really becomes more specific legislation that was passed in 2008 by now Senator Liu, at that time Assembly Member Liu, which talked about defining bullying uh, that are committed by electronic acts, and this goes m further than that by actually specifying social networks. And at that time, it, they were what we have are acts directed against another pupil that constitutes sexual harassment, hate, violence, severe or pervasive intentional harassment, threats or intimidation. So that's really what the Lou Bill did and this in the education and this more adds only the specificity of social networks to that. Thank you. Uh, Senator Runner. Good morning, uh, Assemblymember Campos. Um, my question is really why is the specificity needed? My concern in the next few years, and right now it says in the Education Code, it defines electronic act to mean the transmission of a communications, including but not limited to a message, text, sound, or image by means of an electronic device. Um, to me, that's all encompassing. Who knows what kind of social networking or other aspects we're going to have in the future? Uh, just in a few short years. So I'm just a little confused of why we need to be so specific. In order for um, this to have any teeth, um, you know, right now we have, uh, they call them burn pages, we have, as they talked about, Facebook, Twitter, right. and all of them currently do not, because they're social networks, do not fall under the current code. The electronic. The yes, the electronic. So we need to add these couple of words uh -huh. uh, to clarify the definition so that there can be some teeth to uh, this particular uh, policy. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Other witnesses in support? I mean, uh, members of the committee or in opposition? Uh, I didn't mean to declare you, Senator Runner, I did not mean to declare, you know, how your vote would be yet. Would you like to close, Assemblyman? Uh, members, this is uh, extremely important for uh, the schools and, and for the future well-being of our, our pupils, and I respectfully ask for your I vote. Is there a motion on the bill? The bill's been moved by Senator Alquist. Do pass. Secretary, please call the roll. Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Runner? Aye. Runner, aye. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Blakesley? Aye. Blakesley, aye. Hancock? Hancock, aye. Huff? No. Huff, no. Lou? Lou, aye. Price? Aye. Price, aye. Smidian? Smidian, aye. Vargas? Eight, one. Bill has eight votes sufficient for passage, but we're going to hold the roll open for the absent members. Thank you. Thank you. Who's up next? Oh, Assembly Member Harkey. Item number 10, AB 649.
Thank you, Chair and members. You seem to know me personally. <laughs> it's nice to know after a couple years you're recognized around here. Um, I have a, a simple bill, but I think it's very, very important. You're always recognized around here, <laughs> Assembly member. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, California is honored to have produced many men and women that join the armed for forces to protect the country. And in California, there are presently 2.2 million veterans, 35,000 receiving GI Bill benefits uh, at C California community colleges. This number has increased as more veterans, of course, have returned home. One of the most important ways which we can express our gratitude to these individuals is to make, take the necessary steps to make life a little bit simpler for them and to allow them to become successful in the civilian world. Obtaining a college degree is very important uh, to one of these for their plans for the future. Currently, our veterans are facing uh, some difficulty in receiving federal funds for their education. In order to receive the benefits of the GI Bill, veterans must follow really strict guidelines to take a specific set of courses in a particular time frame. Uh, which has now become an obstacle in California because classes, of course, are impacted and overbooked. AB 649 will clarify that the veterans receive a priority in registration for classes in our community college and state universities. By providing this pri as a priority, veterans will not only have a smoother transition, but will also have the ability to meet the requirements of the GI Bill so they can take full advantage of this uh, federal funds that they have earned. In addition, AB 649 will extend the period that a veteran could receive these privileges from two to five years. Many veterans require more than two years to decompress after discharge prior to enrollment. And a transition from the military is difficult and often accompanied by PTSD, mental health issues, and other service-related challenges, family issues as well. So extending the enrollment period to five years will provide veterans time for personal adjustment before pursuing a higher education. This bill is an important step to California and shows our appreciation for our veterans and how they have served and to help allow them the necessary tools to work back into uh, the civilian society, earning a degree which you know is vital in the 21st century. So this bill also received bipartisan support and, and co-authorship in our House, and I would respectfully ask for your I vote and any co-authors you would wish to add. Before we hear the witnesses in support, I will state to the Assembly member and to the members of the committee that typically this committee only passes out one bill on a particular topic in a session. We have already passed out the same bill with the years, four years, uh, for, with Senator Correa. My sense is that if we pass this bill out, we would want to do the same four years, because that's what the committee negotiated with Senator Correa with the extension. Um, he also requested originally five years, and the committee moved it to four years. I think you're going to have to convince us or convince me why we need two exactly, two bills that are almost, that are exactly the same to come out of this committee. If you can't, my recommendation would be to hold the bill at this moment until we see what happens with the Correa bill, which is the committee has already passed out, passed out of the Senate and sent to the Assembly. So that's really where I'm coming from, and I'd like to hear why, why we should be passing out two bills of the, exactly the same. We heard about this posthumously, <laughs> so it to is, speak. Yes. Well, it is a problem. So I, I am here, and if we'd like to combine the bills, I have no problem. As uh, long we don't as, either, as but that's as, up to you As long as the they do the member. same thing and what, accomplish the purpose that we're trying. As you know, we don't track your legislation really carefully, but I was scheduled for this I, hearing, and I am here before you. I, I, I realize that. Okay. I'm just letting you Do know. Do we have our witnesses, witnesses in, support? in support? Is there anyone that can answer that question? Well, I mean, why, we, why do you want us to pass out the same bill that we've already passed out? Uh, Senator Lowenthal, thank you very much. I'm Dana with Pete Conaty and Associates, uh, representing the uh, joint sponsors of the bill, AMVETS and the Student Veterans of California. And you also, I think, supported Senator Correa's bill. Yes, yes, we did. Um, as, the, as the Assemblywoman has uh, pointed out, uh, these veterans need time to decompress when they come home. Class, due to budget shortfalls right now, uh, classes are very limited. I myself, I'm not a veteran, but I am a junior college uh, student. I go take welding classes at American River Junior College. Pro over half the classes, veterans, uh, because of the specialized nature of it and the vocational aspect of it, instructors are very scarce. 
equipment is scarce, the class offerings are very scarce, and some of these folks have to wait maybe two, even three semesters just to get into the required classes for the degree or for the certification. So some of them have to roll over an extra year, year and a half, uh, just to get that extra specialized class. We, we agree with everything you're saying. We've already passed that bill, is what we're saying. Tell right, us right. why we should do two exactly same bills. Correct, yeah, and I would like to also introduce uh, Dustin McMillan. Uh, he is a 20-year- oh, You're gonna have to answer the question. Yes, sir. Well, he-, he Hopefully he I, can. My, my, my name is Dustin McMillan. I'm with the Student Veterans of uh, California. Sure. I'm an Iraq and Afghanistan veteran. I just completed my uh, bachelor's in government uh, two weeks ago using the post-9-11 GI Bill. So uh, what we see is, you know, uh, the way I was, I was gonna say is that uh, veterans, student veterans pay their tuition up front. Excuse me, I'm just going to interrupt you. Is there any reason, is there, can anyone explain why we're running a same bill as, as, as uh, Senator Lou Correa? Well, it, the way And you, since you're sponsored now. And you both. sponsored both and you supported that bill. So also. I'm just wondering, is, this, is there any difference here or can we just sign on with, with Senator Correa and be, be happy? Well, obviously the more time we can get for these veterans who are returning, five years is better than Well, four. this committee is doing okay, four but, years. But that, that is four the years. difference then. That well, is Senator the, Correa came with five also, and we did four. He did that, not. that is the difference engine then. So I will, I will take it that you're going to put my bill on hold, and I will be happy to work with Senator Correa. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have left. Let's see who we have. Assembly Member Bell, and I think I think you proceed, Assembly Member Davis. Yes. AB 194 is ahead of AB 1085. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, members, um, today I'm presenting AB 194, which is the Foster Youth Public Higher Education Priority Enrollment uh, Legislation. Um, some people get up here. I'll just start. Foster Youth and uh, former Foster Youth face significant barriers to accessing higher education. The challenges start early on as multiple foster youth care placements make it difficult for them to achieve stability in their education. Uh, one, one day uh, last week, uh, I heard one foster youth that had been in 20, 20 schools by the time they turn 18. So it's really difficult in terms of their um, preparing themselves for higher education. Um, the statistics are that over 70% of youth in foster care want to go to college. Only about 20% of foster youth actually do. And only 2 to 3% of former foster youth actually graduate from college with a four-year degree, so it's two to three percent. And this cannot continue. And we're all working on this, and this bill, AB 194, will provide priority enrollment for classes to foster youth and former foster youth at the California's public colleges and universities. Under our existing law, the California community colleges and California state universities are required and the University of California is requested to grant priority enrollment to students with disabilities, active duty military and military veterans. And I'm asking the state to extend the same benefits to, to a segment of the population that is most underserved in terms of opportunities, Mr. Chairman. This bill would ensure foster youth are granted access to the classes they need in order to graduate. And the numbers of foster youth and former foster youth attending these public institutions are relatively low. It's a relatively low number of students. Unfortunately, too low. Yeah, too low, but the impact is going to be huge if they can achieve this. Uh, and um, 
that's a key to their achievement is uh, from education standpoint is a key to their success and I respectfully ask and I vote from the committee. Thank you for your Thank you, time. Thank you, Assembly Member. Witnesses in support. Good afternoon. I'm Teresa Rowland, Special Projects Director with the Career Ladders Project for California Community Colleges. We work statewide to foster educational and career advancements for Californians through research, policy initiatives, and direct support to community colleges and their workforce partners. We operate under the auspices of the Foundation for California Community Colleges, the nonprofit auxiliary to the community college system. We want to commend Assemblyman Beal and the co-authors of AB 194 for their recommendation to require priority enrollment for students from foster care. Addressing access for these vulnerable students in a time when enrollments are shrinking and less seats are available in our public institutions of higher education is clearly critical if we are to increase the number of foster care youth who can access and complete college certificates and degrees. We are especially pleased to see that the bill includes the California Community Colleges, the CSU, and UCs, since not all students who cho choose the same <coughs> post-secondary route. Some youth will transition directly to a four-year college following high school, while the majority of foster youth who do attend college will do so at a community college where they can obtain certificates and degrees that lead to employment and or transfer. Information from the free application for federal student aid tells that community college is the institution of choice for former foster youth with approximately 6,000 students from foster care attending our 112 colleges in the state. We believe priority enrollment for former foster youth is critical if we are to increase the post-secondary education outcomes and thus earning and lifelong self-sufficiency of former foster youth. Priority registration is an important component that cuts across all efforts and could keep the doors open for these youth so that they can get the courses they need, particularly the key English and math prerequisite courses to complete their college goals. Existing statewide registration priorities for community colleges include veterans, DSPNS, and EOPNS students. Additionally, community colleges can and do implement local enrollment priorities. In our work with colleges statewide, we have discovered very few which prioritize registration for former foster youth. More than any other group of students, youth from foster care have critical financial needs. The passing of AB 12 will help, but there are still severe economic disparities with these youth who are vulnerable and do not have stable family systems to fall back on. Helping them gain a foothold in college is the least the state can do. This bill is well-timed to build on existing initiatives and efforts aimed to help foster youth access post-secondary education and guide them in their goals to achieve self-sufficiency, college credentials, and employment. For example, the California Community College System's Foster Youth Success Initiative, the Foundation for California Community College's Youth Empowerment Success Strategies, along with the statewide California College Pathways Initiative and many individual college programs are all working to support enrolled foster youth. The Career Ladders Project currently leads the Community College Pathways Inif Initiative, working with 12 community colleges statewide on strategies to strengthen foster youth outcomes. We have early data to share with you from students who are currently enrolled in community college and from foster care. The data shows that of the 49 foster care students surveyed from four colleges in our initiative, approximately 55% of students currently receive priority registration through programs like EOPNS but less than 45% do not, and for these students, getting the right classes is difficult. Our early results show that students from foster care without priority enrollment are not getting into the classes which are critical to their college goal, including needed English and math courses. Public higher education in California continues to grapple with historical budget cuts. Class sections are being cut in unprecedented ways. In the community colleges alone, it is estimated that hundreds of thousands of students statewide will be impacted. The face of access to college is changing, and we are here to say, please respond to supporting foster youth through this crisis. Prioritize enrollment for students from foster care and commit to the state's ongoing responsibility to these youth. The Career Ladders Project stands as a partner with the California Community Colleges and other systems of higher ed to strengthen strategies which help youth reach their post-secondary educational goals. The key to preparing them for a lifetime of success and self-sufficiency. The bill's been moved. <clears throat> Brevity is best when the bill has been moved. <clears throat> Other witnesses in support? Rosa DeAnda with the California Community College Chancellor's Office. For the reasons mentioned by the author, we are in strong support of this Thank bill. Thank you. 
Mr. Chair and members, Khadija Alam Javid with the Advancement Project, and for all the reasons stated, we're in strong support. Good. Nicole Wardleman on behalf of the City and County of San Francisco, AB 194 will eliminate barriers to a college education for underserved youth. We are in support. Good. Other witnesses in support? Judith Michaels, California Federation of Teachers, in support. Mr. Chair and Committee, Bonnie Slauson, representing the Community College League, to express our support. Thank you. Thank you. Kathy Sunderling with the County Welfare Directors Association, in support. Nadia Leal Carrillo at the University of California, in support. Miles Nevin, Executive Director of the California State Student Association. We appreciate the Assembly member proposing this bill, and we strongly support it. Antoinette Camo with the University of California Student Association, in support. Kim Lewis with the Spirit Net, one of the largest foster family agencies, in support. Andrew Martinez, California State University, in support. Are there any witnesses in opposition? Not hearing any. Any committee members wish to? Senator Liu. Um, Assemblymember Bell, how many kids do we have left uh, in the foster care system here in California? Do you have any well, idea? It's, it's uh, <coughs> dropped. It's gone down. The it's, formal it's dropped, number right? of, of kids have gone down because of of what we established uh, as a state priority for family reunification. So, so more families are, um, are reunifying right. uh, the parents with the foster youth. So it's actually dropped. But a lot of those children that are reunified have spent time in the foster care system, uh, even if it was a temporary period of time. So by the time they're 18, a lot of those kids have um, been in the foster care system, but we've encouraged families to reunify. So we actually have numbers have dropped. And there's been um, foster adoptions, ado adoption systems that have lowered the number as well. So, so um, and we know when I started in the uh, assembly, we had about 100,000 kids yes, in the 60, foster care. Right. So about 60,000 yeah, today. More or less. And, you know, of, th of that percent, I mean, have that number, about 20 percent, is that what you're saying? I think it's less than 20 percent go on to higher education, isn't it? Uh, we think it's about 20 percent. It's, it's, uh, the, big, the big number is the two to three graduate. Two to three four, percent. Two, two to three, three percent, percent from a four-year college. Right. That's, that's the latest numbers we have. So we want to get that number much higher. And um, the, the idea of continuing their education as quickly as possible is the motive for this bill. Right, and, and you want to start them with in the, at least, because our community colleges have open access, right, in, in 18 year olds. I'm not, a, I, I'm not opposed to the bill and because, because I do, do care for this particular population, but the bill that we just saw would also give priority to um, veterans who also have need. Mm -hmm. and. You know, I, my only, I guess, caveat would be I'd be mindful of calling out particular segments of the population when we have an open access po um, uh, policy toward community colleges, um, and then you're, we're setting up in here right. a priority of who 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 right. who can have access. Absolutely. And and um, we should pull the bill on sons and daughters of legislators. <laughs> 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 right, but but you know, but. But it's, it's, uh, it's also, too, because we're also having a problem with community colleges in terms of success because, right. because we have a, a, a dropout rate in our community colleges, about 70 percent. So it is a, it's, you know. I think you've raised a critical point. <laughs> no, I mean, we have difficult. priority. Right. We've, it's supposed to be limited. The more we make it expansive, we really impact the, more, the very nature of it. That's what members will have to decide. Does this is this worthy of that priority? Well, role? it is. It is worthy. But then, who do we cut out? I mean, if there's limited numbers. As I said, sons and daughters of legislators. <laughs> Senator Hancock. Thank you. But I, not grandchildren. Not grandchildren. <laughs> I, I think Senator Liu raises a very important point too, because if we're yes. rationing education, yes. because we are not willing as a community put adequate amount of money into higher ed. That is a very, very disturbing right. thing. And I totally agree with that. I, I do feel both with veterans and with foster children, however, uh, especially foster children whom we, the state, removed from their families for whatever reason, that we have an obligation to them and that we have not risen to that occasion very well. 
for a long time. There is much more that we should do. And with veterans as well, who have been off literally risking their lives and sometimes their mental health for the rest of their lives uh, for us. Uh, these are people to whom much is owed. And I feel that they should have not only priority in terms of enrollment, getting into classes, but the supports that they may need to succeed. And then it's our job to make sure that we get the money into these systems so that they can reach all the, the people that, that need to get an education for their well-being and the well-being of the state of California. But I, I would very much like to be added as a co-author, <laughs> uh, Assemblyman Bell, should the occasion arrive. Thank you. And I will take that as a motion when the oh. time is appropriate. Set. Senator Ron. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Assemblyman Bell. Your heart is always for the foster care youth, and I know we worked together when I was in the Assembly as well. And as an adopt, uh, foster adoptive grandmother, yeah, right. see, this could work. Uh, <laughs> I met him. I met him. It That's what work. he said. <laughs> um, you know, uh, our grandson was lucky and actually has a family that can help him through this process. Uh, but those emancipated youth that are out there that just don't have anybody being their champion and they're struggling to find food and shelter, uh, this is one way we can say, here you go. You have an opportunity here. You can register. You can get help. You can get financial help to go to school. And it's just, I think, a one, one small step that we can do to help the foster youth. So thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you. Any other comments? Assembly member, would you like to close? Um, you know, you know, one of my experiences is I mentor a foster youth, so I, I've been mentoring this foster youth that's now at the University of California at Berkeley in the graduate school and graduate from Stanford. Uh, he has $100,000 in loans on his back. Wow. And one of the things is getting them through quicker so they don't have all that financial burden because they have nobody to co-sign their loan. They have nobody to help them, as you were pointing out. Uh, Senator Runner. So, so we, we, it is important a priority to get them through as quickly as possible. I urge and I vote on the bill. Thank you. And the, I'm not sure whether the Senator. Huh? <laughs> bill was moved by Senator Alquist. Sorry, Senator Hancock. But you did ask when the appropriate time to be added as a co author. Yeah. Yeah. With that, the Secretary, please as, do pass. Will they pass to Senator? AB 194. Okay. Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Runner? Aye. Runner, aye. Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Blakesley? Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Buck? <coughs> Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Price? Aye. Price, aye. Smidian? Aye. Smidian, aye. Vargas? Aye. Vargas, aye. Eight. Bill has eight votes sufficient for passage, but we're going to place it on call for the absent members. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Member. Thank you. Assembly Member Davis. AB 1085. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I guess it's still morning. And members, distinguished members of the Senate Education Committee. Um, today, uh, I'm here to present AB 1085, which is a bill that deals with the interdistrict appeals process. Uh, this bill, AB 1085, would amend the existing 30 calendar day timeline to 40 school days for the state's largest counties to make a decision on an internet, uh, uh, inter district, uh, inter district appeal. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we will accept the recommendations of the committee um, amendment to add a uh, July 1st, 2015 sunset, sunset. sunset provision. They, yes, sir. That will be accepted as an author's amendment. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, this bill is indeed um, needed to address an increase in the number of interdistrict appeals that some county boards of education have experienced. As a result, it has become a challenge to meet the existing statutory timelines. For example, Los Angeles County Board of Education has been experiencing a heavy volume of interdistrict appeals in the 2010-2011 <clears throat> academic year. As, a, uh, as of uh, March the 1st, 2011, uh, a total of 501 appeals have been filed in the 2010-11 academic year, uh, 
AB 1085 will provide the necessary timeline for processing and hearing appeals filed by parents and students. The bill is sponsored by the Los Angeles County Office of Education and is supported by the San Bernardino County District Advocates for Better Schools and the Hawthorne and Wiseburn School Districts and the Riverside County Superintendent of Schools. I have here with me uh, the sponsor of the bill, Pamela Gibbs, Director of Governmental Affairs, uh, Go Governmental Relations, and Maria Bravo, Consultant for Student Support Services of the Los Angeles County Office of Education uh, to answer any technical questions. I ask for you, I vote. Uh, thank you. Witnesses in support. Uh, good morning, Mr. Good morning. Chair and members, Pamela Gibbs, representing the Los Angeles County Office of Education. We'd like to thank Mr. Davis for carrying this very important piece of legislation, and uh, we appreciate the thoughtful analysis uh, by the committee staff on the bill. Um, as you heard in uh, the author's statement, Mr. Davis's statement, we've had an unprecedented number of interdistrict appeals um, visit our office over the last couple of years. Our goal is to continue to provide pupils and their parents with an opportunity to have a thorough yet expeditious um, hearing of their appeals, and uh, we believe AB 1085 will help us do that under these circumstances. Uh, we strongly urge your support for the bill, and we have with us Maria Bravo, who can answer any of your technical questions. Thank you, Maria Bravo from LA County Office of Education. Um, the extension of the existing timeline is necessary so that we can provide students and the, par the parents the detailed attention that each of our cases require. Students and parents deserve an opportunity to have their issues heard and processed with care as they often do not have that opportunity at the district level. When we process these cases, we deal with nu numerous issues, such as obtaining the necessary docu supporting documentation from both parties, scheduling of hearings, investigation, and follow-up. It has been evident that the existing 20 working days <coughs> affords us an insufficient amount of time to process the amount of appeals that have come through LACO. On a side note, as of yesterday, our office um, has already processed 157 appeals for the 2011-2012 school year, and we began the season in April. This is already a large number for us so early in the season, as we normally see the increase beginning sometime in late June, early July. Rest assured that by, by extending the timelines, we will not view it as a reason to slow down and, and to take our time. Our main objective is to provide students and parents a final decision as quickly as possible so that students can attend school. Since our office also oversees school attendance, enrollment, academic counseling, we fully understand the importance of having students be placed in a timely manner as it affects their social, emotional, and academic process, progress and achievement. As such, we respectfully ask that you allow for the extension of the timelines. Other, other witnesses in support? Terry Burns on behalf of the San Bernardino, San Bernardino District Advocates for Better Schools and San Bernardino Superintendent Gary Thomas. Uh, we support the bill. We've had an increased number of these cases as well, and we believe it's an important action. Thank you. Are there any witnesses in opposition? Let's return it. Assembly member, I'm supportive of the bill. I do believe that... And I'd like to hear that, you know, as we go back to what Senator Hancock said, as we start to not provide public education with the funds, and as parents begin to see that their schools are tremendously impacted, they begin to look around to, at other schools. And, and so it places greater, greater responsibilities on those uh, parents who, who want to find schools and then also on the school districts for whether they can receive those parent, those students and then appeals process when they don't. And so we understand it. We also appreciate that hopefully with this uh, extension by putting it in a sunset that at some point we will begin to fund schools again. And so we want it in a more timely way. We appreciate this is a temporary fix to a problem because you're being overwhelmed now because of the lack of resources that are being provided public education. So I'm very supportive, but I do hope that we reach a day where we won't need a bill like this, even though today we do need this bill. Senator Fuller, uh, uh, a runner. <laughs> I always forget my name. No, no. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I do have a concern just for the child and the parent that are already waiting the 30 days, and those are school days,
to have decisions made. They've probably already waited already a month um, before it actually gets there as well. So I'm concerned about the parents and the students primarily um, not having the access and the sooner we get them in a school of their choice or the choice that's decided for them, the better it is. So that's my biggest concern. The extra 10 days is really uh, an extra two weeks uh, to get that done. So I'm not really sure why I'm going with this. So, <laughs> But I just wanted to say I think it's really important for the student to be in the school as quickly as possible and in the school that's deemed most appropriate for that child. And I agree with you, and I share your concern. Um, uh, as the chairman did state, uh, the unintended consequences of what has occurred is that there are so many volumes of cases presenting that it does not allow the larger school districts to expedite those in a timely manner. And I do represent a couple large school districts. Senator Simidian. Well, just a follow-up question. I, I'm prepared to support the measure today, but <clears throat> I have some of the same concerns. Is the current review period 30 calendar days? And we're talking now about going to 40 school days. So 30 calendar days is about four weeks a month. 40 school days is actually eight weeks, about two months. Right. So it's a pretty significant increase. Right. And I have the same concerns about leaving kids and their families out there in limbo while we're sorting all this out. I think, you know, what I would say, and I'm comfortable supporting the bill with the, um, with the sunset, but what I would say to the districts is, you know, I won't be here, but others will be, and I'm, I'm hoping that when that sunset date comes, people are looking to see did the districts sort of drag out the process and wait until the very last day in every instance, or did people really try and move these through the system as expeditiously as a full and fair process would allow? I, I just, I, I'm hoping that it builds a little accountability in for the districts, and I just want to put that on the record before I support the bill, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Blakesley. Yeah, I think I want to actually echo um, the concerns of the good senator. This seems to relieve some pressure on the administration at the expense of the student. And I understand, um, obviously, that uh, um, to a reasonable amount of time is needed to make an informed decision. But according to my analysis, um, if you actually put together all the delays and times that would be entailed, reading from my analysis, a final decision right. could take up to 12 right. weeks or three months of the nine-month school year, which means this family which has made this decision, they want to do this for whatever reasons, um, could uh, find themselves where a third of the school year, th their child has lost a third of the school year, um, simply to be maybe uncharitable, to make life a little easier on the administration and give them more time. And I'm a little, I'm concerned I'm not seeing any accompanying uh, reforms or, or revisions to the administrative process to help give us some assurance that this isn't just used as a way to reduce the workload as opposed to improve the work process and putting this child first. So I, I guess I'm kind of troubled that this seems to be kind of a solution, yes, but one which um, puts that cost on the student and asks nothing more of the administration. Senator, Senator Alquist. Where does the bill oh, go from here? Oh, I'm sorry, Senator I, Hancock. I didn't. Oh, go ahead. No, go on. Senator Thank Alquist. you. Um, where does the bill go from here? The bill goes from here to the floor. To the floor, because I have some reservations also about the great length of time you're extending it. I don't think that that's necessarily a good thing for students. And I want to support your bill, but at the same time, I want you to think about is there <coughs> some time in between? Uh, because I'm not sure if I would vote for it on the floor because of this, I think, great extension. The, what do you think about that? Well, I, I, they did vet it out in the Assembly Education Committee with both those educators as well as the members of the Senate Education, I mean, the Assembly Education Committee. What has happened is, is that the over 
uh, concentration of cases presenting have been so overwhelming that the districts just cannot perform to standard. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, the lack of funding and the lack of adequate staff, if you will, mm -hmm. to, to handle these cases mm -hmm. don't allow them to perform to the standard that, that we're talking about. Uh, I share your concern and wanted to expedite uh, each case that students have, and I think that the uh, general attitude of the department is that they will get to them as expeditiously as possible and that there will not be a, a conscious effort to delay mm -hmm. any one case, but yet when we look mm -hmm. holistically mm -hmm. at the caseload, the <coughs> education system just cannot respond mm -hmm. satisfactorily or successfully given the lack of time. Mm -hmm. So that is my understanding, and I'd like for them to add as well, experts. Well, no, that, that's all right, yeah. but would it, it, as a parent and a grandparent, it does seem to me that this benefits the school district and not necessarily the student. And I will be willing to vote for the bill today, but I'm, I really need to think about this issue. I'm not really sure what I will do on the Senate floor, and I do suggest you might consider some time that's in between. Okay, I know that one district had 500, and the, the, real, the reality that that could be achieved in that less of time, I don't know how realistic that is as well. So. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Hancock. Yeah. How many people here read Catch-22 in high school? <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> um, this is an interesting situation. We have severely limited money in education. We are talking about the really horrific possibility of additional cuts to education. We say, keep those cuts away from the classroom, <laughs> uh, meaning it, they should come from administration. Then we say, but we don't want to do anything to make life easier for these administrators with their increased workload of inter-district transfers. So let's not have flexibility. Another interesting book, The Year of Magical Thinking. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to support this bill because there is a sunset. I think that Senator Simidian is right. We need to get data so that in four years we can look back and see how it was used because running out the clock is not um, a great technique for anybody. But we have to recognize we're operating under constraints. And in my view, flexibility in these circumstances is warranted and it will help us keep cuts away from students in the classroom. Senator Huff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Glad you recognized on the far, your far left. The far left. I always look to the left, <laughs> Senator Huff, and but I usually audience, see you on the far on my right. Left. I shall live up to my reputation. Um, I, I'm glad we have the sunset in here because it was a non-starter without that. Uh, our funding is hopefully a temporary problem, and so that addresses that issue. I'm still struggling with the length of time. As you know, I'm a champion of choice within schools, inter-district transfers. The fact that there are more people looking to that, more parents, says they're trying to maximize their education for their child. They're looking around. And as an organization that's interested in meeting the expectation the needs of the parents, we want to facilitate that. I certainly think, as a, as a group, we want parents to have their kids in a school that they feel comfortable with, they can help them achieve and, and reach their potential and be contributing citizens. Um, and that kind of hits to Senator Blakesley's and some of the other comments uh, about the length of time and who is it hitting. We do have limited resources, and I get that. I, I tell you where I am right now, though, I think going from 30 calendar days to basically four weeks is too much. And maybe somewhere in between would be better, um, you know, instead of, excuse me, from eight weeks. We're going from one month to basically two months. If there was one and a half months, that ought to help ease the workload but not be that much more burden on the parents because it's a tough process to go through and they're trying to get some resolution and this is actually making it more difficult for them. I understand the fiscal restraints. My solution would be just take the barriers away from schools, let parents go and let the district decide. But I know that's not going to happen here, but uh, you know, if, if you could come halfway between where it is now and where you would like it to be, I could support it, but without that amendment, I can't. I first of all wanted to clarify that this bill deals specifically with the appeals process. 
there is an entirely different inter-district process going on before um, the appeals even begins. So the parents may or may not wait for a period of time to submit their request for an inter-district transfer. And then, of course, the district has a period of time to deal with that. And there are many uh, requests that do not come up for appeal. What we're talking about are the ones that eventually come to appeal. Um, and at this particular moment, we're dealing with five times the appeals that we've ever had um, in history. So we're asking, yes, perhaps to double the time, just for a limited period of time until things shake out and we figure out why pupils and parents are leaving the districts that they are, or I don't, you know, whatever the issue is, there's something going on at the district level that we can't really address at our level. So what we would really like is an opportunity just to fairly hear the, the, the appeals and as humanly possible, we try to expedite them as best we can. Um, we are not inclined to delay any uh, appeals. Um, we try to expedite them uh, and we want to assure you of that. As Dr. Thomas would concur uh, with Ms. Gibbs, we try and we recognize the issues that are involved here. We try and move these decisions as quickly as possibly so parents aren't left hanging. Um, we think it's important that you do a good appeal process. Um, I would express the concern to Senator Blakesley and, and Senator Alquist that this isn't just about the administrators. This is about a fair appeal for the parents and the folks. If you condense the timeline considerably, what happens is you get administrators who say, okay, just no. And uh, you want to have a time for folks to make their good case, to make uh, their appeal, and uh, we think it's important that you have this availability. Follow-up question. Certainly, Senator Huff on my left. On the, <laughs> and you on my right. Um, <clears throat> so, does what trigger the appeal, is it, let's just walk through the normal process. So a school, a, a parent asks for an inter-district transfer in the school district that they're applying to, actually the, re the district, either one of them can say no, can't they? And then if that breaks apart, then it goes to the county in the appeals process. Mm -hmm. So you have schools that don't want their kids that live in their district going because now we are treating kids more like an ATM card, the ADA that goes with them. So in the past, they probably did let them go, and now they're saying mm, no. And so that's probably what's triggering this inundation of cases, right? Yes. It's potentially a big piece of it. Yeah. I understand the issue better. I appreciate your thoughtful comments. I will support it. I'm still not happy, but I understand the workload is higher. We're I, not happy. We have to ask. I, I wish right. we could actually open up more choice to students so it didn't have to go through this cumbersome process. I, I Assembly member, I think you've had a full hearing. Yes, sir. I think members are understand now the issues. Nobody likes the resolution, including the committee. That's why we put a sunset on it. It'll be up to the members. And even, and I, and I also say, I would hope that you listened, that even yes, if sir. you get this bill out of this committee today, that is no assurance that the members who are voting for it today are going to vote for it on the floor. So with that, would you like to close? I would just simply say to the committee that this extension of time is not to prolong an individual case, but rather it is to provide the appropriate time for our districts to succeed in doing their job in resolving these appeals. Thank Actually, you. I With that, is there a motion on the bill? Bills? Well, Senator Hancock beat you. <laughs> Senator Hancock defers, doesn't want her. Senator Price. The bill is due pass, I believe. Due pass as amended. As amended. To the Senate floor. Lowenthal? Aye. Lowenthal, aye. Runner? Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Blakesley? No. Blakesley, no. Hancock? Aye. Hancock, aye. Huff? Aye. Huff, aye. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Price? Aye. Price, aye. Semidian? Aye. Semidian, aye. Vargas? Aye. Vargas, aye. Sen we're going to lift the call, no. Sen. Okay, so what's in the middle? This is the final. How much? Eight 
one. That bill has eight votes, sufficient for passage. It is out. We're going to lift the call now, members, and the first one is we're going to go in file order. Secretary is going to read the, the present ta uh, tally and where the chair and the vice chair are. First bill is AB 130, Senator Cedillo. And I do believe that do is pass. do pass. Do pass to appropriations. Chair voting aye. Vice Chair no. And the vote is 4 2. Blakesley? No. Blakesley no. Lou? Aye. Lou aye. Semidian? Aye. Semidian aye. Vargas? Aye. Vargas aye. 7 3. That bill has seven votes, sufficient for passage. It is out. Next bill is AB 176, Assemblymember Lara. Do pass as amended. Present vote is? Four to two. Chair voting aye. Vice Chair no. Blakesley? No. Blakesley no. Lou? Aye. Lou aye. Semidian? Committee and I, Vargas. Aye. Vargas, I. Seven. Bill has seven votes, sufficient for passage. That bill is out. 194. AB 194, Assembly Member Bell. The motion is due pass, pass to appropriations. Chair voting I, Vice Chair I, Blakesley. Aye. Blakesley, I. Huff. Aye. Huff, I. 10-0. Bill has 10 votes. Bill is out. Next bill is AB 288, Fong. Do pass as amended to appropriations. The chair voting aye. Vice chair aye. The vote is 8 0. Semidian? Aye. Semidian aye. Vargas? Aye. Vargas aye. 10. That bill has 10 votes. That bill is out. Next one would have been AB 649, Harkey. We're holding that. And she's going to work with Senator Correa, who has the same bill. Next bill is. AB 746, Campos. Motion is due pass. The Senate floor. Chair voting aye. Vice Chair aye. The vote is 8 1. Vargas. Aye. Vargas aye. 9 1. Bill has nine votes. That bill is out. And then the last one, I think everyone was here for AB yes. 1085. And yeah, then the we'll go calendar. to the consent calendar. There are three items on consent and one additional item on consent with amendments. Those items are item number 2, AB 169, item number 6, AB 230, item number 8, AB 334. Those are on consent. And item number 4, AB 180, is on consent with amendments. Okay. Please um, call the roll. The vote is 8-0. The chair voting aye. aye. Vice chair aye. Semidian? Aye. Semidian aye. Vargas? Aye. Vargas aye. 10. Bill has, the consent calendar has 10 votes. Consent, consent calendar is approved. I believe that concludes our work for today. This committee is adjourned.